welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you from Vitality Stadium. We're here to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club throughout the course of the season. Now, for those who haven't tuned in before, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. As ever, we're joined by Mr Bournemouth himself. My colleague Neil Perrett is here at Vitality Stadium alongside me. Neil, it's fair to say we've had an enjoyable few weeks watching the lads out there. Always enjoyable when they're winning to watch them, isn't it, Zoe? Of course it is. And I've got to say, today's guest, in all my time watching and covering the club, has probably made more of an impact than any other player I can I can think of in, well, too many years to to, uh, to remember. But really looking forward to today's podcast, yeah. Absolutely. We've got a really exciting guest on our podcast today. It's a man who's only signed for us in the summer, but has already made quite the impact on the pitch, as Neil has said. We're looking forward to delving into his early years, testing his Scottish knowledge and discussing life on the South Coast. So without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Ryan Christie onto the AFC Bournemouth podcast. Ryan, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. How are you enjoying life down here? I'm loving it. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, it's great. I feel like I've, I've, I've settled in nicely now to the area and stuff and I feel um, you know fully part of the, the team now, which is nice. Well, we're going to get straight into it. We really appreciate you joining us. Now, to kickstart us here today, um, we've done our research, but we've gone a little bit above and beyond today, and we've spoken to someone who knows you better than anyone. We're going to hear from him now. Watching his career, the club career, has been just phenomenal so far, and it's, it's but I'm a big Scotland fan. I was at the you know the last time we were at a big tournament, as you know, Neil was 90. I was there. I went to Paris to watch it with six pals, and you know I've, I've often take big interest in how the national team do. I think it's important for our football in this country that we do well. We've had a really disappointing two decades. So in 2017, and I got the tip off that day that he was going to play that night. You know, I'll not say who by, but, and I, I still couldn't believe it until I saw the team lines an hour before kickoff. They were playing the Dutch at Petaudry and Marky Mackay, um, who I knew Marky, and he started, Ryan, in fact, he played the whole game. He had a very good game against a very good Dutch side. So, you know, when your son's out there singing the national anthem for a father, there's not a lot that's involved in football. There's not a lot better, to be honest. Ryan, we've got a couple of other clips coming up from your dad, Charlie, during the podcast. He played for and managed in Inverness Caledonian Thistle. He had two years at Celtic as a player and he's now the academy manager back at Inverness. I know it's a silly question, really, but just tell us how much of an influence he's had on your career. Yeah, massive. I think... Um... You know, now that I look back at it, I realise kind of how fortunate I I am, I am having him kind of, you know, so close to me in terms of someone who's been through football, done the career, you know, knows the the pitfalls and, and stuff like that. And um, when I was growing up, he was my coach throughout the, the Inverness youth when I was coming up there. And, um, you know, there were certainly times where I didn't enjoy it as much because... Um, you know, if we didn't play so well, everybody got a, a rollicking after the game. But I, mine continued to dinner time until um, I went to bed. So, you know, it wasn't great in um, that aspect. But like I said, now that, you know, I've kind of grown and, and managed to, to get myself a football career, I look back to it and think, you know, it was absolutely priceless. We'll come on to that a little bit later. We've got a little bit more of a clip about that. But so your dad, his dad and your uncle Ian were all footballers. It sounds like a bit of a no-brainer that you were going to follow them was there any peer pressure or were you just sort of kicking a ball around for the moment you could walk? Yeah, I think that was it. I think, um, you know, obviously having so many people around you that are just football fanatics um, definitely helps when you're when you're younger. Obviously, Neverness is, is quite a small place. There's not too much to do, you know. So um, the first opportunity my dad would have got to, to put a ball at my feet, um, you know, he would have done it. And I think everybody... Um, you know, up there in my family, just constantly kind of lives football, you know, so it's always, it was always around me from a young age and all these kind of like little 1% probably have, have helped me get to, um, you know, manage to, to kind of break into the, the football world. Um, and yeah, like I said, now that, again, now that I look back at it, you don't really realise it when you're younger, but it's now when you look back and think, God, all these, all these little things probably paid, played in a, an important role. Now, we understand that Inverness's arch rivals Ross County tried to sign you as a 10-year-old, selling, sending you a letter asking you to go there for a trial, but your dad pulled rank. Just tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't have the um, the hatred that he still has for that for that rivalry, but um, yeah, I think, um, I don't even think that 
decision was remotely me at all. That was all him. But I think at the time they actually had their academy started a year younger than Inverness's. Um, so, you know, it was either there or nothing. But I think um, my dad was responsible to kind of kick the Inverness into gear when he heard that, um, when he heard that Ross County could be an option for me. I think he almost went as far as to say that um, Inverness didn't have an under-10 set up. He went to the board and they sanctioned giving him some money so he could form an under-10 team <laughs> yeah. so they could almost keep you at the club as well. Is that oh, That's what he said to me. Yeah, well, that shows you how much that rivalry means, means to him. He was... Um, <laughs> He was that was his driving force to, to get that up and running and um yeah, I was I was in Vernas through and through from then on out. Now you weren't the tallest as a youngster. Did that ever hold you back or did you ever have any concerns that, you know, it might mean that you don't quite make the grade? Um Yeah, I, I was I was very small. I got it I was funny, I was speaking about this last night. Um but yeah, I was I was I was really small as a youngster and then obviously I played up a year which which didn't help at all. Um Especially in the Scottish game, there's, a, there's quite a big kind of stigma about, you know, it's very, very physical. And um, that's probably one of the first things they, they look for, if you can handle the physical side of the game. Um, you know, I think it's getting better now, but, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, your kind of technique and that was put, that was the kind of second thing they looked for. Um, but yeah, I, I, I got very lucky in terms of at that kind of breaking point in football, kind of 16, 17, 18, I seemed to hit a bit of a growth spurt then at the perfect time, which was nice. Um, but yeah, there was um, there was a couple of uh, times in my younger days getting thrown off the ball. Did sure. it make you stronger as a player? I think it made me realise that I needed to be sharper on the ball so that hopefully nobody can get near me to push me off it. Um, but yeah, it, listen, it definitely helped. I, I had also a, a kind of period at the under 15s in Scotland. They, they jumped from under 15s to under 17s and I think then it would have been too big a jump for me to then go play two years above so I kind of stayed under 15s for a year which which really kind of helped me um you know I didn't get you know completely bullied at, at that age group and and um you know from then on I managed to, to kick on which was nice. Now I want to ask what was like what was life like growing up in Inverness for for people that are listening to to this from Bournemouth the city has a smaller population than Weymouth um, so it's obviously a very small place, and it's also been uh, been voted as one of the happiest cities to live in in the UK. Yeah, it's um, be- beautiful place, beautiful part of the world, um, and you notice that more and more the older you get. But when you're younger, <laughs> it's one of these places you just kind of there's not much to do, and you know you're you're desperate to to maybe go out and see a bit more of the big bad world. So um, I think football wise um, definitely helped me because. I mean, you've just kind of got your your group of friends, and everybody that's everybody's main goal is just to become a football player. And everybody, obviously, you, you all play in the same team. You play against each other at school level. Everybody knows each other. Um, you know, so then when fo- uh, school finishes, it's it's the, all the same people down the park playing football every night. So, yeah, my my kind of um, childhood growing up was just football twenty four seven out the back garden and out in the parks, which was good. Now, we asked your dad for any anecdotes from your youth football days, and this is what he came back with. One of the ones I always remember is we used to go away, we still do, well, obviously, after COVID, we used to go away to tournaments abroad. So we were in Denmark at quite a, a good tournament, the Dana Cup, it's called, and um, we had a squad, I think we were under 15s at the time. And we were travelling a game, it was quite, we were playing a good Swedish team, full-time team, and we were playing in the quarterfinals of the competition, and... We're driving the tournament. We stayed in a village about half an hour from the tournament. And we just got to the venue where this quarterfinals go on. The boys are quite tense, even as his coaches. I was a coach there over to see the whole event. And I just said, right, guys, you've got everything. You know, you've got your juice, your water bottles, your snacks, everything, blah, blah, blah. Thinking no problem at all. One person pipes up. I forgot my boots. Oh, my word. Now, honestly. The other two coaches, at the time, I wasn't, I, I had quite a quick temper, shall we say, and you, you're quite tense as it is anyway, because you've got this quarterfinal knockout match to look forward to, and I've got Junior telling me that, of all things, he's forgotten his match boots. So we've, we've had to send one of the coaches, but luckily we found somebody, one of the parents that were over with a car, that hired a car, so they basically broke the speed limit driving back to the hotel. But I, I don't think, it took me about three days. He's lucky, actually, because he scored in the game. We beat the Swedish team. We beat them 2-1 and Ryan scored. But that saved his bacon a little bit, you know. I think it took me about 72 hours to speak to him. 
That was your dad there, obviously reliving that story. You were laughing along as if you remembered <laughs> it. Just give us your side of the story. Just let it go. It's 17 years old, you know what I mean? Just <laughs> let it go. We won the game. We got to the semi-finals. It worked out fine. I knew as soon as he said uh, we were on the way in the minibus, so the flashbacks came straight away. But um, yeah, well, that was a nervous time. And I'd noticed that I'd forgot the boots early on and it took me a good 10 minutes just to muster up the courage to let somebody know about it. <laughs> There's been more than one occasion, silly stuff like that. But yeah, it's, um, like he said, I think because I actually went on to have quite a good game, that's that saved me a little bit. Um, but yeah, funny times. So just confirm, you remembered your juice, you remembered your snacks and you probably remembered your shin pads, but not your boots. How does that happen? <laughs> I know. I know, that's ridiculous. Oh, so bad. I actually ended up doing that again um, three or four years later. And I I couldn't, I can't think, I, I remember thinking I cannot make the same mistake again and, and let him know. And luckily another one of the boys had a spare pair of boots. Um, but I, I'm a size like seven, seven and a half and he was a size 10. And I wore his size 10 boots <laughs> in a game and just thought this is better than telling him. <laughs> Uh, now, schooling was very important to you as well, obviously with your dad's influence in that. Just give us an insight into your younger days, your sort of daily routine, your schooling and your football, how that all intertwined. Um, yeah, I, I, I quite enjoyed school, to be honest. Um, obviously, for me, football was, you know, that was the main aim for me. It was never going to change. And even to this day, when people say, what would you what would you have done if you weren't a footballer? I don't really have an answer for them, which, you know, some people think that's a bit crazy, but sometimes I argue that's the mindset you've got to have to, to be a footballer. But um, my dad, you know, at the same time was was pretty strict on, on making sure I had my kind of qualifications in place. And um, when I had the opportunity at the end of, we call it secondary school up in, in Scotland, um, to, to kind of move in full time to, to football, um, my dad had told me, kind of, you need to. This is what you need to get in your in your grades. If you don't get this, then you're not doing it. So you know, I had to kind of buckle down for a couple of years and and make sure I got them. Um, and then after, I think he was happy that I had that kind of that backup if if I ever needed it. And if football didn't didn't go well, um, but yeah, like I said, I enjoy I enjoyed school. And the nice thing about Inverness is quite small that everybody, um, you know, knew that I obviously wanted to be a footballer, but in terms of like my teachers, everyone like that was accommodating for that. Um, you know, nobody kind of stood in my way and, and all the teachers and PE teachers and everyone was always doing anything they can if I had to leave school early for, for training or anything like that, um, you know, which is really nice. Now, your dad's told us that you're a bit of a bright spark, so we're going to actually put that to the test now. Got a little uh, six fit six quick fire questions for you three on scotland and three on dorset so we're going to kick off with the scottish questions which famous scottish figure was depicted in the 1995 film braveheart i'll be william wallace one out of one it's an easy one to start very good when is saint andrew's day oh <laughs> <laughs> oh my word I honestly have no idea. I'll say, random guess, 17th of May. Not far out, 30th of November. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, yeah. you, might, you might be able to redeem yourself with this one. How many miles did the Proclaimers walk? That'd be 500. I Give believe. two out of three. Yeah, two I'll out take of three that. on Scotland. It's past marks. Moving on to Dorset. These are all multiple choice, slightly easier for you. So what is Durdle Door? Is it a local delicacy, a landmark, or a well-known restaurant? I think that's a landmark. One out of one. Which of these players did not play for the Cherries? Paul Gascoigne, Rio Ferdinand, or George Best? Good question. Um, I'll say Paul Gascoigne. Yeah, you're right. Very good. We thought you might have gone for George Best there. but Yeah, it was either. Oh, okay. Yeah, two out of two. You could get more on the Dorset <laughs> questions than you did on the Scotland ones. <laughs> really feeling at home. Which of these is not in Dorset? Piddle Trentide, Apple Cross, or Scratchy Bottom? 
<laughs> Scratchy bottom. What? I'll say um, Apple Cross. You're correct. You know where it is? It's in Scotland. It's in the Highlands. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it's part of the North Coast 500, I'm pretty sure of that. So three out of three on Dorset and two out of three on Scotland. Not, <laughs> not bad, not bad. Um, going back to your education, your dad has said that if you were to get five hires, which is obviously equivalent to A-levels for anyone that doesn't know, in your final year at school, he would let you give football a crack. How determined did this make you, or, or did were you determined enough anyway? It sounds like you know there was no other choice for you, and there was no other career in mind. So it certainly sounds like you were very, very determined anyway. Yeah, I think um, I was just desperate to to play football, and obviously, at that age, the sound of kind of full time football. You know, you, you're used to kind of training maybe twice a week when you're growing up in school on the side, but the thought of just football being your life every single day is just like a dream come true. So. Obviously, when he said that, I realised, you know, if this is the one thing kind of between me and that goal, then, you know, I'm just going to have to knuckle down and do it. And to be fair, there was a few a few tutors needed and an extra time at, at school. But, um, yeah, I managed to get there, thankfully. And, um, yeah, he, he stayed true to his word. I've got to ask, what subjects did you get these five hires in? I got them in maths, English, chemistry, biology, PE, of course, and then uh, I did a sixth, actually. I did the uh, history as well, I'm pretty sure. You didn't get one on um, famous dates in Scottish history at all? <laughs> no, no, we did World War II, I'm pretty sure. For, so uh, quiz me about that next time. Father was obviously very demanding on you as a kid, as you've said yourself. A couple of your coaches had told him that they thought he was too hard on you sometimes, and this is what your dad's had to say on that. I'm not one, Neil, for giving plaudits, to be honest. I'm quite demanding. I've got a daughter as well as a son. They'll both tell you I'm quite demanding. You know, I'm the academy director in Burness, and sometimes I don't think we challenge our kids enough and demand enough of them. I'm, I'm you know, it's so I, I was always demanding of Ryan. Physic, the physical aspect of it was a challenge from when he was younger, especially playing that year at Neil. Um, the following year, we, we went to Denmark for that term. The following year, we went to Lisbon. It's the best tournament we've ever played in. We were rubbing shoulders with Marseille, Sporting Lisbon, Benfica. Really top teams were taking sides there. And we got to the semis. We actually got knocked out on penalties in the semifinals that year. And my two coaches were back to the hotel after getting knocked out. And we were a wee bit deflated, but we'd done well. And my two coaches turned around to me and they said two things. They turned around to me and says, you're awful hard and a young fella. <laughs> and, I, and I could take it from them because they were both older than me, Neil. And they're both experienced. They both played the game. And they says, you're awful hard and young Ryan. You give him a, you demand so much of him. And then they both turn around and says, he's got a hell of a chance. And I'm going out. And he was 15 at the time. I says, do you think so, guys? And they says, honestly, Charlie, you don't, you know, I know you you like him. You see him as a good player. But yeah, I don't think you're realising really how good he is and the potential that he's got. So that was the first time I really thought he had a, a genuine chance, you know. And, and, he, and it was interesting in, in that tournament, we played a Spanish lower league team in the in the group stages. We beat them quite heavily. And their coach came up to us after the game, really pleasant guy, spoke perfect English as usual. And he actually, we were talking to him, and he, I says, what players of ours do you stand out? And he says, oh, he says, you're number six. And it's funny, Neil, because I, I couldn't remember who was playing number six in the day. And he says, you're number six is head and shoulders above everyone else. And I thought, and my other coach, Ronnie, turned me and goes, that's Ryan he's talking about. <laughs> it's quite funny, you know, but, you know, I, and obviously the Spaniards, they like that type of player, Neil, don't they, you know? That was obviously your dad talking about, you know, you playing all these youth competitions and sort of realising when you might have been good enough to make it. When was it for you that you sort of realised in your head, OK, I, I actually could have a career in this? Um, I'm not too sure to be honest. My, it's strange trying to think back to my mindset. Obviously, you get asked quite a lot when you eventually kind of start playing professionally at, or you know, when you make it in football. Um, but I, I didn't really ever think like, oh, I might have a chance. It, it was a bit more, this, which sounds bad, but a bit more kind of happy-go-lucky with it, where I just thought, this is just what I love to do. And as long as I can keep doing this for as long as I can, I'm just going to see where it kind of takes me. And it's just, you know, something that I've just pride myself on. So, um, yeah, obviously when it got to maybe kind of under-18s, under-19s at Inverness, then it's a we it kind of creeps into your mind okay like I need to try and break into this first team whenever I can or you know impress the manager when I get the chance but up until then it was you know just playing because I absolutely loved it and, and really enjoyed playing football and 
it's obviously nice kind of hearing stuff. I've never heard that story before, so shows you how much he tells me. But um, yeah, it was you know it is nice kind of hearing stuff like that. Um, I think people were kind of talking about me making it maybe way before I realised that I had a, a proper chance. Now six six of your intake were taken on as professionals by the club, which I think is very rare for that that amount of players from one intake. Terry Butcher offered you your first pro- con- professional contract, I believe. Do you keep in touch with any of the other five and who, who are they? A couple, yeah. Um, that Obviously, we came, that, that age group was, like my dad was saying, we came from like the under 12s all the way through. So, you know, it was who you played football with throughout your whole kind of childhood. So we became so close and, um, you know, it was, I mean, me, um, Liam Power still plays. He he, he he made it. He's playing at Kilmarnock now in Scotland. Uh, he was at Liver- uh, Motherwell for a bit. Um, and it was kind of me and him. He, me and him played in centre midfield. Um, and then the other guys are mostly, there's, you know, there's the Highland League up in Scotland. Uh, some of them play in that. And then some of them are just at, at amateur level. But, um, you know, anytime I go up to Inverness, it's so small. If you if you're out on a Saturday night, you you normally bump into one of them and then, you know, all the kind of old stories and catching up comes out, which is nice. But yeah, even <laughs> moving into that kind of full time aspect of football, because you were so used to having everyone around you, it was less kind of scary. It was just like, you know, now we're just training every day with the same group of boys and and it was not as competitive, I think. I think, I, you know, when I moved to Celtic and I see their kind of youth team, I see like it's it's a lot more kind of cutthroat and they're in the same team but they realize that you know it's there's maybe one or two limited spots whereas i think we were all just kind of in this collective that we love playing football and if one of us makes it then amazing just tell us about terry butcher a famous man in england history obviously that bloodied picture of him stands out for everybody what was he like to sort of meet if you like and play play under as a young lad scary it's <laughs> the first <laughs> word that comes to mind for me um Obviously, an incredibly successful football player, like you said, probably obviously a bit too old for me to have appreciated, but as soon as someone like that's your manager, you do your kind of background on them. Um, but yeah, kind of obviously had this massive aura about him, um, walking around the, the, the um, training ground day to day. Um, and then when I was younger, just going into the under-19s, um, like on a match day, a first team match day, my job was like stand outside the first team change room. If anyone needs anything, get them it without asking any questions, basically. Um, but I also then heard through the door, you know, if it wasn't going so well, his his wrath. And oh my God, I just remember thinking I'd be in tears if I was in there right now. So um, that was a bit of an eye opener to, to men's professional footballer for me when I was still, you know, pretty young. Um, but listen, obviously very successful at Inverness at his time at Inverness. He, he kind of lifted Inverness from when he came in in the championship, um, or it was League One back then, and got the club back to um, the, the top the top flight and then kept them there and maintained a, a high level. Um, you know, in that aspect, I was quite lucky of, of where, I, where the club was at when I came into the system. Have you heard that from inside the changing room under Scott Parker since you've been here? <laughs> I'm not going to let too much away, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's, well, hopefully not, hopefully it doesn't come, hopefully I never see it, but um, you know, I'm sure I'll see it soon. Terry Butcher left for Hibs in November 2013, he was replaced by John Hughes, just tell us about working under him. Um, I honestly couldn't speak high enough about John Hughes, um, just a, an unbelievable football person in terms of he, he he's never had the recognition he has for how good a football brain he he has he obviously is from i think quite a, a rough part in in edinburgh um you know so that kind of accent he's got he's got with him and he's quite kind of rugged and down to earth um but you know when you strip that back and realize the kind of ideas he has and what he changed in Vernes because when he came in obviously terry butch very successful quite direct football that we played um he came in in the kind of january um, he didn't really t- change too much early on because it was the middle of a season. He didn't want to ups- upset too much. But that following pre-season, and that's when I kind of came into the, the first team properly. Um, and he, we started playing out, f- you know, from the back and just playing total football, which in Scotland is, you know, it's quite hard to do with, you know, the, the pitches up there and the weather. And um, yeah, from from where he then took the, the team and not really bringing in players of his own either he did it with what he came in with 
um, and just the perfect manager for me in terms of suit, the way he wanted to play suited me, but in terms of how he dealt with me as a young guy and, and just kind of drip, drip feeding me. First team football was amazing and you know, anytime I'm, I'm speaking on, on a podcast or anything like this, I try and speak as high as I can about him because I just I don't think he gets the recognition he deserves. Now, he obviously thought very highly of you as well because it's we haven't got a clip from your dad here, but when I spoke to your dad earlier this week, he relayed this story about when John came in, the under-19s and the first team at Inverness trained in the same place, but obviously on different pitches. John would train the first team then he'd go over and watch the under-19s training with his coach, Scott Kelliger. And um, John John looked at Scott and he said, um, that lad there, uh, who is that? And apparently Scott said, you're joking, aren't you? That, that's Charlie's son, Ryan Christie. And John said, well, why is he training here? And Scott said, well, he's an under-19 and he, he you know, plays with the under-19s. And apparently John said, well, from what I'm seeing... He's the best player at the club. Make sure he's in with the first team on Monday. That must have been a huge confidence boost for you to come fast track like that, if you like. Yeah, that again, that was only a story I only heard kind of recently. I heard him speaking on a podcast and he, he said that. Um, yeah, it's, it's obviously really nice. He was sim- similar to my, my old man in ways that he, you know, he didn't give you too much praise. He, he wasn't like he picked me up and carried me to the first team himself, but he, you know, he, he, he pulled me up um, and then just, just kind of let me play. I trained <coughs> for um, a good few months with the first team. Um, you know, he was quite hard on me. I, I remember at that time, like, I, for some reason, I was the only player in training. I just wasn't allowed to get fouls. <laughs> so, like, the bigger boys would just lump, kick lumps out of me and I would look at him and they would just play on. That was it. Um which I laugh at looking back at now it used to wind me up in training but um, yeah just like I said before the way he kind of dealt with me and um, then we then played Aberdeen in the League Cup final um, where we, we got beat on penalties um, actually but I was named in the squad to travel and I thought I was just there to basically carry the hampers in and out of the, the, the stadium Um and then we got to the hotel and he put me on the bench and I thought, oh my God, this is happening. Um, and then he uh, put me on an extra time um, and I don't think I breathed for the whole time I was on the pitch. But um, yeah, just looking back at that now in terms of the significance of that game, you know, to put a young guy in, I just think, you know, it's, you know, it's quality from him. And, and then from then on, I didn't really look back and, and he helped with that. He just kind of drip feed me more and more into the team. Again, I was lucky towards the end of that season. The team were kind of safe. You know, we were definitely further away from relegation. We couldn't really catch anyone above us. So the last three or four games, I got to play um, and then did well. And then from from that pre-season the next year, kind of kicked on. I want to take you back to your full debut. It was against Celtic and it was a team that included Virgil van Dijk, Scott Brown and Timu Puki. What are your memories of that day in December 2013? Um, good, obviously, for making my debut. Um, Any time, especially in Inverness, a home game when when Celtic or Rangers come to town, it's it's ma- massive, you know, because it feels like the city doubles in population for the day. Um, and obviously, it's always a, a packed out stadium. Um, so yeah, that was an, another day where I thought I, I was, you know, somehow on the bench, like incredible, um, incredible experience just to be on the bench. And then yeah, I think we were. 1-0 down um, and he put me on with 10 minutes to go and again I can barely remember anything it was just pure adrenaline um, and then I actually got a chance I ended up being offside at the back post but I headed a chance over the bar and then I thought oh my god I've I've mucked up my debut kind of thing but um, yeah it was it was some experience and then obviously quite strange and fitting to make my debut against Celtic and then end up playing for them so it was, that, that, was, that was good Absolutely. Now, not long after we'd won promotion to the Premier League here, Inverness won the Scottish Cup, beating Falkirk in the final. Inverness beat Celtic 3-2 after extra time in the semi-final, and that was one of the biggest upsets in Scottish football history. For you, it must have been such a memorable game, and for your family as well. Yeah, it was um, certainly one of the um, favourite games I've ever played in my career. Um, A bit of a mental game, obviously Celtic, Virgil van Dijk whipped a free kick in like absolute top corner I remember standing in the wall and the moment he hit it I thought well that's in um, and then 
second half or end of the first half there was a bit of a controversial controversial decision where there was like a one of our de- defenders kind of handballed it off the line but it wasn't given as a penalty and then um came out second half and um, their goalkeeper got red card it kind of flipped the game on its head and then we 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 dominated it and then obviously at the time like I said we played total football and even when I moved to Celtic a lot of the boys said like you were one of the best teams to um that played against us in terms of the football we played um which was obviously a nice compliment after I went to Celtic. But yeah, the way we wanted to play when when they went to 10 men, it was just down to the ground and went all the way to, to extra time and then um, managed to get a winner. And yeah, it was um, incredible. It capped a, a brilliant season for you and it all started with a first appearance for Scotland under 21s. That must have been a really proud moment for you as well. Yeah, yeah, that was um, yeah an- another um, uh, kind of amazing um, achievement, which at that point I didn't, even remotely think of kind of similar to my full debut for for Scotland as well in terms of I was just enjoying club football so much and you know getting to start playing in the first team even just training with the first team that um you know even when these things were coming around an international break I didn't even think like oh I should check the squad to see if I'm in it was like somebody just came up and went, oh by the way you've been picked and it was like another you know um a step that I didn't think I'd be able to to take so um, yeah, it was nice. It was a great bunch of boys, and a lot of those boys have actually moved on and and play with the first team now, which is good. I think has actually helped us um, in the the kind of men's A team for Scotland now because of uh, a lot of us that have been around each other for so long. Um, so yeah, it was it was really enjoyable. When Ryan, when you signed here a couple of months back, you were quoted as saying that Bournemouth had been interested in signing you when you were a young player. What what can you sort of tell us about that? How did that all come about? Yeah, so um, when I was l- literally just starting to play for Inverness first team, um, I mean, I was I was very young, so I didn't really get too much of the details. I think my dad being one, and um, everyone was trying to kind of keep me away from it. Um, but I think Bournemouth put a, a bid into Inverness. Um, I was invited down. Um, it was it was Eddie Howe at the time. Um, I was invited down to see the the training ground and. Um, but I think that this decision was made that I, you know, I'd, I'd only just broken into Inverness first team, and I just didn't really think I'd, you know, played enough first team football basically. Um, so I wanted to kind of make my mark in Inverness, especially being an Inverness boy growing up, and and only just managing to break into that first team. Um, I wanted to kind of stay there and have a good run in the in the first team. Um, but yeah, I think that season was at the start of the championship season. It was Bournemouth were. We're definitely not expected to go up, that's for sure. Um, so then obviously a year later when, when you did go up, I started thinking, oh my God, have I made the worst decision of my life here? But uh, eight years later, here we are, so I can't complain. What, what's interesting though, um, you know, obviously this is an internal sort of podcast we're doing, but it, it says something for our recruitment that they've spotted you all those years ago. And like you said, eight years now, here you are, but you could have been here eight years ago. I know, I know. And um you know, I've had a couple, obviously Richard Hughes has mentioned in terms of the first time he came to see me play, which was years ago. Um, Matty Wells, the assistant, said he saw me play in Vernessa against St Mirren. Ages ago, he he was scouting somebody that was on loan from Tottenham or something at his time at Tottenham. So it's funny actually how many people here have, have seen me play all those years ago, which is quite cool. And um, yeah, when I signed, obviously Richard Hughes was kind of saying it you know, seven years later or eight years later, but we finally got there, which is, it's nice. It feels like almost it was kind of meant to be, which is cool. Now, you eventually joined Celtic in the September 2015. You're immediately loaned back to Inverness, playing in the Europa League for your hometown club. That must have been another huge moment for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, listen, the, 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 the obviously the the move to Celtic was kind of blew everything else out of the water. It was It was massive and... Um, you know, probably if anything w- woke me up to ins- to the kind of real life, kind of finally moving out of my mum and dad's house and moving down to Glasgow, which a little boy from Inverness, that's basically the the big smoke. And um, yeah, it was scary, but obviously, yeah, the, Inver- the Inverness playing in in Europe was was amazing. Um, and obviously, people said it at the time when we were doing it, it was one of those things where you won't really realise this achievement until years down the line. And it is times like now where I look back and think, you know, it's, it's a mental 
a club the size of Inverness was, was playing in Europe and I got to be part of that. It was nice. Now, injury saw you recalled from that loan spell. You eventually made your Celtic debut and you scored your first goal for them in a 7-0 win against Motherwell. And then you then you played in the Champions League at the following start the following season. And then you got a loan to Aberdeen, which ended up you stayed there for about 18 months. Just what was behind all of that and why weren't you playing for Celtic, if you like? Yeah, so when I, when I joined, obviously, I, I, so I joined with the, um, my injury. I managed to get fit about February time. Um, that was under Ronnie Dyla. Um, and even though Celtic were winning, um, the league or was top of the league at that point, the team were going through a wee bit of a sticky spell. Um, and he basically, he, he was good with me, to be fair. He, he pulled me in and said, listen, I do want to play. You'll get minutes here and there. But at this point, I... You know, we're under a bit of pressure. I want to stick with the team or the, or the guys that I know and, and can trust, um, which I can understand as a young boy com- coming in, not really, you know, prove myself at the level that Celtic played at yet. Um, you know, so, you know, it was okay, but um, after that summer, Brendan Rogers came in and it was the same kind of limited minutes and stuff. And, you know, anyone, anyone that plays football will tell you in terms of, the longer that kind of length of period of time without playing regularly goes on, just the more frustrating it gets. And um, by that January, the the time the January window um, opened the following year, I thought yes, it's time for me to 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 go and get some game time. So, but again, Brendan Rodgers is amazing with me. He kind of said, um, "Listen, I like you as a player. I'm not telling you I want you to leave, but I'm also saying you're not going to play every week. You're going to get sporadic minutes here and there." So. Um, if you find a club that 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 fits and is right, um, you know, go for it. And then it was literally I came out of the office and five hour late. <laughs> funny, fast word spreads that Derek McInnes, the Aberdeen manager, called me and I thought, yeah, that out of everybody else, that's probably the perfect team in Scotland for me to go to. Um, and I absolutely love my time at Aberdeen, so it was good. Now, your Celtic career really started to take off in the 2018-19 season. You helped them win back-to-back trebles, which was obviously the, the Scottish Premiership, the Scottish Cup and the Scottish League Cup. They must have been some really great times for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my my dream or my goal as soon as I moved to Celtic was to be you know, an important player for the club. Um, obviously, I was a Celtic fan growing up as well. Not as much an Inverness fan, but... You know, in Scotland, you have to pick Celtic Rangers. It's like at birth, you're labelled with one of them. So, um, yeah, I was a Celtic man growing up. So, you know, I was just desperate to feel like I'd, um, you know, not given something back to, you know, but just had my mark in the club's history. Um, obviously, when I came back to, to Celtic from the loan spell at Aberdeen, it was still tough because I didn't really go into the team straight away. I had a year left in my contract and I, thought that with a week to go in that window um you know I thought it was kind of time for me to move on basically um and I remembered that deadline day driving into to Lennox Town Celtics training ground on the phone to my agent and he basically said right um if if um if you've got the go ahead from the manager to to leave um I'll be waiting outside get yourself off the training ground as soon as you can um, and we'll be on a car. I think it was either to it was either going back to Aberdeen on permanent. I think Hibs were interested and uh, Sunderland were interested in in League One. So my head was kind of all over the place. I was sitting at, at breakfast and then um, the assistant manager said, "Oh, the manager wants a word with you." And I thought, "Oh, this is it. He's going to kind of wish me all the best. That bid's been accepted." And he basically flipped on his head and said, "No, you're you're staying put. You're not going anywhere." So um, yeah, it was a mental kind of twenty four hours. Um, but then from then, I just thought you know he wants me here I've got a year left in my contract just kind of give it everything and I had to wait a couple months um, for my opportunity but when it came around finally things just seemed to, to click into place and obviously there's always a bit of luck in football there's a few injuries and I managed to get my, my crack at it I managed to stay in the team ever since which was which was nice. I've got to ask what is that like as a player you know it's deadline day and you've got potentially three clubs on the cards then you're already at a club what go through your head how do you even you know get through the day yeah it's it's mental um it's hard to kind of because in football you've got um such a short amount of time to make these such big decisions whereas you know maybe in other walks of life you can mull over it for a week or two um and pick the best choice whereas in football it normally comes down to like you've got an hour to decide if, if you want this to happen or not which is all a bit mental but 
lucky enough that day the decision kind of got taken out of my hands a little bit which was nice um, and the moment I kind of stepped out of the manager's office I kind of thought right that that's me and at least I know my future now um, and all I can do now is, is try and break into this, this Celtic team which was um, easing um, which was good for me I think moving moving forward. Your dad, he spent two years at Celtic, but he didn't make a first-team appearance. Was there ever an element for you of sort of doing it for him as well? Yeah, I mean, obviously there was a lot made about how similar up to our, our careers were up to that point in terms of like playing for Inverness, moving to Celtic, and then the first year, you know, not really breaking in. Um, and obviously my dad plays a, a massive role and I'm on the phone to him every other day about football and... You know, he was as frustrated as me as not playing at Celtic and, you know, he was just desperate for me to play and after the Aber Aberdeen loan especially where I got so much joy, he, you know, he he was the same. He thought, listen, there might be time to, to move on on this but I think he was equally as delighted when I got the news that I wanted to stay and then obviously when everything, when I eventually started playing, I think he, he, he was chuffed because he's definitely a bigger, a bigger um Celtic, Celtic, Celtic man than than me. Or well, to be fair, he, he was the one that that made me a Celtic man in my um, in my childhood. But yeah, I think it, it meant a lot for him to me to to finally play for the club. Ten titles in a row and immortality in Scottish football eluded Celtic last season. Obviously, Rangers winning the title that year. After all the highs, what was it like playing for Celtic? You know, when it wasn't all going to plan. Yeah, it was tough. It was. Um, Something that obviously we weren't used to as well, and the fans weren't used to. I mean, we ever since Brendan Rodgers came in, um, you know, we, I mean, obviously the first season we went unbeaten, um, and we just won every single competition we entered basically. So as soon as that got disrupted, it was like complete meltdown for, you know, for us and then the the supporters as well who who weren't used to it. Um, you know, it's hard because. Again, it's it's one of those situations where years down the line you step back and realise what an incredible achievement that the club um, had at, at that time, um, and and a crazy kind of bar to set to keep doing it year in year out because it you know it got to the point in that third and fourth, I mean the treble treble the quadruple treble that it was like the start of the season it was like right if we don't win the treble treble it's a bad season which is like what other club has that mentality it's mental. Um, so yeah, it was obviously a huge shock to everybody when it when it didn't go our way, and um, obviously a lot said about the kind of intensity of the old firm. Um, it is mental. Everyone li lives and breathes football up there, which is a good thing. It's 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 amazing that it makes people's lives up in Glasgow, especially, and all around Scotland. But at the same time, you know, when you're playing for one of these teams and it's not going your way, it's it's tough because you really struggle to kind of switch off from it, basically. Um, you know, and then you start feeling like, you know, you've let people down and you don't want to be seen in public because, you know, if you've been beat that day and you want to go and have a nice dinner and you think, well, I don't deserve to be having that nice dinner and, you know, it plays with your head, it's it's mentally draining and I think that happened for a lot of us um, that season, um, which was tough. But like I said, again, you look back at it now, me personally, I think, you know, it's made me tougher as a as a person, as a footballer, it's it's. I've learnt lessons from it, which now I, you know, I'll I'll use moving on in my football career that will help me, which is, which is nice that even after all that kind of hardship, you still feel like you've come out of it with a positive. For you, coming from the Highlands, what was it like moving to a big city like Glasgow? I think you said earlier that you lived in Glasgow when you were playing for playing for Celtic. It it seems like it must have been a, a big jump, and the term goldfish bowl springs to mind there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, obviously when I first moved down, um, that was, you know, first time um, out with my mum and dad's and, you know, you've got to cook for yourself, you've got to wash for yourself. So it was like a reality check really quickly into life. Um, but it was good. I seemed to, to handle it okay. Um, obviously because of that goldfish bowl you're in, all the players at Celtic are really tight. You know, if you, if you do do anything social, you normally do it with those you know your teammates because they're in the same kind of category as you and um yeah it was good it it was when it's going well it's incredible because you know nobody could say anything bad to you or you know everybody just looks up to you like you know you're um you know some sort of um god almost but um on the flip side of that obviously when things aren't going so well like i said it's it's difficult but 
again, incredible, incredible experience. So many people, you know, are, are desperate to play for Celtic and people in football and out of football. So to say I got that opportunity, I'm, I'm forever grateful for. Bournemouth fans will probably want to know if you ever crossed paths with Marvin Bartley, who you may not may know started his career here. Did you ever play against him? I did a couple of times, um, and he was always so, <laughs> he he actually was really nice on the pitch in terms of um, like when he spoke to you, he'd be like, "Oh, you're right, Ryan, how you doing?" and stuff, and then I'd get the ball and he'd lamp me six feet in the air. And he picked me up. Go, oh, you're right, mate. And I think you just like I want to feel angry at you, but you're so nice. It's like I can't. Um, so yeah, yeah, he was he was a good guy. Played against him for Hibs and um, Livingston as well. So he's kind of moved into the the media side of the game now, thinking he's doing well, which is nice to see. And what was Scott Brown like to play with? Amazing, amazing. I mean, he has this reputation. <clears throat> You know, everybody, that's probably one of the first questions people ask you, especially kind of Celtic supporters, like, what's what's Bruni like in, in, in real life kind of thing? And obviously he has this kind of demeanour and, um, you know, everybody thinks he's just this tough, mean guy. But um, honestly, again, like, you can't speak high. Everything you want from a captain in terms of when I kind of went to the club, he was he was brilliant with me. Um his, his, his leadership, the standards he sets in training are like, incredibly high. Um, but, you know, he, he sets that standard himself by by his drive. Um, and every single morning, you can, if you're, you're lacking motivation or something, um, you know, you just look at him and look at the way he trains, especially in his last few years at the age he was with Celtic. And you think, like, it's incredible for, for what he's done for so long in his career to, to keep having that drive and keep having that mentality. Um so yeah, it's, I think it's only once I got to play with him, you then realise like how he has been so successful as a as a professional footballer. Um, because yeah, it's his drive and mindset is is different level. Not too many links between Bournemouth and and Celtic, but Peter Grant was a coach here uh, a few years back. He was obviously a legendary player at, at Celtic. Now his son Peter Grant scored for Falkirk in that cup final. Now did you ever have you ever worked or seen Anything of Peter Senior? I know he's more your dad's era. No, he was my assistant coach actually at Scotland at one point. He, um, when Alex McLeish was the the manager, he was the assistant. So, um, yeah, I was on a good few trips with him. Um, he was good. He was a great coach. Um, you know, he, frustratingly, it didn't really work out for, for Alex McLeish, and um, he moved on. But um, yeah, it was it was nice. Obviously, he I can't even remember. I think it was after. His son scoring that goal, and he would always kind of remind me of it, and and joking that I, I stole all his his um, his son's kind of spotlight. Um, but yeah, um, he was great. He was a great coach. Um, Any time I got to work with him. Now going back to your dad again. Now, when we when I spoke to him earlier this week, he 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 was fairly outspoken about some of the criticism that you received from some Celtic fans for leaving. He said it was unwarranted and nonsensical. Now, I know that you have been understandably a lot more reserved. Did it hurt you after such a successful period at the club? Um, no, not not overly, um, if I'm honest. I mean, after that kind of um, 10 in a row season that, that didn't happen after that, you know, that initially gave me, you know, a bit of a, you know, a stronger backbone. Um, and I obviously realised from that season not to read into <laughs> much of the press because, you know, it wasn't it wasn't too positive around Celtic at that time. So, you know, I learned a lot from then. Um, and I knew I knew in my kind of mind that it was exactly what I would. It was just the perfect move for me. So it, there was no kind of sense of doubt or, you know, second guessing it at all. I just thought this is everything I've wanted to achieve at Celtic I've, I've done. Um, like I said, I was, I was so grateful for the opportunity to play for them. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to, to score in cup finals, win trebles. Um, and when, you know, I looked at my Celtic resume, I, th- I thought, you know, I've I've wanted to do, I've, I've done everything I want to do at Celtic. And the thing I want to do in my football career was, was give it a shot down here. Um, you know, give England a shot because, you know, so many of my peers at the Scottish level played down here, loved it, raved about it. Um, and I've played in well played in Scotland for my whole career up to that point. So um, you know when 
when the Bournemouth thing came came knocking, I just thought it was an absolute no brainer to to finally give it a crack. Just tell us about your first senior cap against Holland in two thousand and seventeen. Yeah, and again another incredible experience and, and memory. Um I was at Aberdeen at the time. Um and I remember uh, again like kind of like the 21s it w- wasn't even remotely in my head that I could get selected for the national team at that point. I was just really enjoying club football and and kind of that's all I was focused on. Um and then Derek McInnes pulled me aside. Um this squads normally come out on a Tuesday afternoon. He pulled me aside on the Monday morning before training and said, "Oh, you're going to get called up for the. We've been told you're going to get called up for the Scotland squad." Um, and my mum and dad were visiting at the time. Um, so that night, I obviously got to break the news to them, which is like amazing, um, incredible. I'm getting a lump in my throat thinking about it. But um, yeah, it was obviously a, an amazing experience. It helped, I think, that I was at Aberdeen at the time. That the, the game was at Pataudry in Aberdeen. Little things like that, you know, help kind of ease you into it a little bit more. Again, like I said, a lot of the boys that I played at 21s with were in that um, in that Scotland call-up. So, you know, it was a lot of familiar faces around the place. Um, and yeah, obviously, um, didn't get to win, but, you know, nice to nice to play your, your debut against a team like like the Dutch, you know, they were incredible and some incredible players on the pitch that night and it was the first time I got to test myself in front of kind of, um, you know, world-class opposition, um, you know, which you're always kind of wanting to do in football. When your move to Bournemouth came about, I think you'd either been on international duty or you, you were going. Have you had dialogue with Steve Clark about the impact that coming here may have on your international aspirations? Um, no, I mean, obviously, I, I knew something might be in the in the in the the pipe work in terms of you know a move coming through and it was again it was like the third deadline day I've been involved in and everybody outside of our football fans will think oh it must be amazing so exciting it's the opposite it's just like pure stress the whole time just staring at your phone waiting for a phone call um and I was obviously back and forth with a lot of people on the phone um that this was the Monday I think the deadline day was Tuesday um, I knew that Celtic and Bournemouth were in talks. Um, I then spent my whole um, afternoon in my room, just staring at my phone, uh, expecting a phone call, thinking like, well, "We're running out of time here. This this needs to start happening." Um, nothing, nothing at all. Went into a team meeting, put my phone on airplane mode, came out of the team meeting, took it off airplane mode, and my phone just like exploded in my hand like my agent saying call me now other people you need to call Liam so I was like oh my god this is happening like you know panic stations I was supposed to have dinner but my appetite had disappeared um managed to call him and he said listen yeah an ag- agreement's been made I think this is this is good to go if you want it to happen um and then again Steve Clark like he said was was amazing in that aspect because obviously being up in Edinburgh I thought I might, you know, at this stage, trying to get a medical done down here would be tough. Um, and he kind of said, listen, you know, you can do the medical up here in Edinburgh. Any way we can facilitate this, um, you know, let me know and we'll try to do it, which was amazing. Um, and it ended up being relatively, um, you know, stress-free come the, come the Tuesday. And then he was just, you know, he was delighted for me and pulled me aside after. I said, listen, I think it's been, you know, a great move. Um, you know, you've had a great time at Celtic and then now it's time for a new challenge and... Um, you know, he he was um, just really excited for me, I think, and, and wished me all the best, which was nice. Am I right in thinking that when you signed for the club on deadline day, you were travelling to an away game with Scotland? Yes, th- thankfully, I managed to... So the plane was leaving at... Th- we had Denmark away, and the plane was leaving at three. Um, and we trained that morning. Um, and after that, I managed to... The, my agent managed to to get around with all the, the paperwork, um, get it signed, and, and then he flew down to, to Bournemouth to, to complete it. Um, but there was a couple of things I was getting sent through my phone, sat on the plane waiting to, for takeoff that I needed to fill out. And I'm thinking, if this plane takes off and I go out of internet here, I'm just going to... And then everybody's asking me as well, saying, like, is it done, is it done? And I'm saying, yeah, it's done, but it hadn't been announced yet. 
So then I'm second guessing myself, like, is this done? Like, I'm calling my agent again, like, are you sure that he's like, yep, 100% done? Obviously, like, it adds a bit of suspense or, you know, like, getting deadline day over the line and announcing it maybe 6 p.m., 7 p.m., you know, it just adds that bit of excitement. But, you know, as soon as I saw, I think it was like the Instagram post from, from Bournemouth saying I'd signed, I thought, okay, I finally believe it now. <laughs> Obviously, Inverness, they play in red and black. Is it true the colours were a major reason behind the decision, decision to uh, to join AFC Bournemouth? <laughs> <laughs> um, my dad will say that. Um, yeah, um, I don't know if you guys know the history of Inverness Cali Thistle, but there was like Inverness Thistle and Inverness Cali, and the two teams merged together in 1994, I think. If I get that wrong, my dad will kill me, but he was a, a Thistle man who played in red and black, so he'll be absolutely over the moon to be seeing me playing in red and black every second week right now. Now we've touched on Scotland. What what's it like to be the only Scotsman in the first team squad here at AFC Bournemouth? Is it weird? Is it nice? Obviously, your whole career beforehand had been in Scotland. Um, I don't know if I, I like or hate it to be honest, but um, yeah, obviously the first thing, well, you know, you do when you sign for a new club. You know, you're you're looking through all the players, thinking, do I know anyone? Is there any familiar faces? Um, and to be there, for me, there there wasn't really. I mean, the one link was was Ryan Fraser, who obviously was at Scotland camp with at the time, um, who obviously knew everybody here. So, um, but but apart from that, I, d I hadn't really crossed paths with with anybody in the changing room up to then, which obviously made it a, a little bit more kind of scary. Um, but you know, the the boys have been absolutely superb. Obviously, the kind of Scotland England thing. It's you know, if if I was moving to France, somewhere like that, and having to learn a language, it would probably be, I'd probably be desperate for another Scotsman in the changing room beside me. But um, yeah, it's not been too bad. Talking of that Scotland England rivalry, the Euros final, were you rooting for England? <laughs> 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 oh, I, I need to be honest here and say that I had the, the Italian face paint on my <laughs> on my cheeks. No, I didn't go that far, but there was a uh, there was a few. I, I was away with pre season at Celtic at the time. Um, and yeah, there was a few of us in the room and we were all uh, jumping up and down when the penalty was saved. Sorry guys, that, that sounds bad, but it's just the Scottish nature in me. <laughs> now tell us a little bit about how you've you've settled here off the pitch. You, you certainly must be finding it a lot warmer than Scotland. Absolutely, that's the first thing everybody said to me, that I would notice the difference in weather. And I kind of thought, yeah, it can't be that much of a difference. And then my first week down here was like I was training in the Maldives or something like that. It was <laughs> incredible. Um, and then actually the last international camp, going back up to Edinburgh, I noticed the difference <laughs> as soon as I came off the plane. Um, so, yeah, listen, that, that's um, certainly been nice, that's for sure. Um, I've seen a couple of the boys this week start to put the hat and gloves on, and I think, Phew, you have no idea. Like The hat and gloves don't come out until it's minus five up in Scotland. So... Um, yeah, that's that's certainly been nice, but I've been loving it. I've I've loved the area so far. Um, I've, like I said before, I've finally kind of feel a lot more settled. I know a lot more of the area now. The boys have been brilliant in terms of pointing me in the right direction. Um, and yeah, it's it's been good. I've had the family down now a couple of times. Um, they've loved it too. First time I've ever lived by a beach, so everybody's loving that aspect. Um, so yeah, everybody told me obviously before I'd love it living down here, but yeah, I really am. What about that dressing room banter because you're a Scotsman? Have you been on the end of any of that so far? Um, been relatively okay so far. So far, a couple of here and there. A um, couple of comments about being tight, stuff like that. It's not gone down too well, but um, yeah, maybe that's where I'm needing another Scotsman to, um, to hold up my side of the argument there. But with six assists in nine games, your teammates are probably delighted with the way that you've uh, contributed to the team. How do you feel you've done? How do you feel you've settled in on the pitch? Again, yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, obviously, I've, um, I'm desperate to score that first goal. I'm, I'm hoping it's coming sooner rather than later. But, um, you know, like I've been saying in the, in the press and stuff, I think as an attacking player, you just want to chip in with, you know, goals and assists or, or create chances for your teammates. Um, you know, so I've been happy enough that I've managed to, to do that so far. And to be fair, all the boys have been absolutely flying. I mean, I couldn't have asked to to join a better team in terms of form and, and how everyone's playing right now. It's been brilliant. And obviously the way the gaffer want is, wants to play football was a big um, aspect for me in joining the club in the first place. Um, you know, obviously I spoke to, with him a couple of times on the phone and everything he said 
um, you know, it was kind of music to my ears. Um, I thought it would suit a player like me down to the ground. So obviously, in that aspect, I've, I've really enjoyed playing under him and, and the style of football we've played. And and so far, it's paying off, um, as you can see in the results. So, um, you know, everybody's just desperate to keep this kind of this run going. And, and that everybody knows that comes with, with hard work day in, day out. Not too many familiar faces in the Bournemouth changing room when you came down here, but you're bumping into a few international colleagues here and there. I saw you chatting to Lyndon Dykes after the QPR game. So, and what do you make of the championship as a level? Very good, very good. Obviously, when I was away with Scotland, when the whole kind of transfer happened, it was I was I was asking these guys around me, you know, um, you know, what's it like, and they were obviously all very um, positive. Um, and they, they, you know, they were saying, "Oh, listen, you know, Bournemouth, good side. They'll, they'll be right up there this season." Um, you know, again, which is, which is nice to hear when you're, when you're hoping to sign for a team like that. But um, yeah, it's nice, to, it's nice playing against all these guys. And the, you know, the difference I've noticed is everybody um, thinks of the championship. I think is like a, a, a physical league. Um, and it is definitely in terms of athleticism. You know, you get some powerful runners and, and really quick strong guys but but a lot of the teams um you know want to, to play football get the ball on the ground which which suits me i think that's helped me obviously that's the way we want to play but there's been other teams you know that have been pressed with that we've played against where i think you know even if we've dominated games anytime the opposition on the ball you need to be really um kind of switched on defensively because you know that any team in this league can hurt you now it's been a, a brilliant podcast with you really enjoyed hearing all your stories but we always end these with a few questions from supporters so I'm going to fire a few your way just to round off here the first one comes from Josh Starks and you mentioned about scoring goals and assists earlier he wants to know what gives you more of a drive is it the scoring goals or is it assisting other players um good question yeah I'm I'm gonna it, you always love to score a goal. It's probably the the biggest buzz in football. Um, but if you can't do that, then you're just obviously desperate to to um, help help in uh, any way you can. Um, you know, like I said before, now I'm itching for that first goal, and when it comes, I'm hoping you know three, four, and five get added to that. You know, you're always going to set your goals at the start of the season of how many you want to get. So um, you know, hopefully, I can I can tick those boxes by the end of the season. Next question comes from Rich Neil. He wants to know, you've obviously, well, you've talked about the different styles of playing the, the Championship and the Scottish Premiership, but which one do you prefer? Um, so far, I would I would say the Championship. Um, you know, what I'm, I'm also enjoying about the Championship is um, is all these kind of new grounds. Obviously, I thought um, a couple of weeks ago playing Stoke, that was an amazing stadium. Um, Bristol City, that was a really cool stadium to play at. Um, you know, obviously we've got some great stadiums up in Scotland as well, but you know, after eight years of playing in the same league, you're you're just about used to them every other week. So, um, yeah, I'm really enjoying that aspect, kind of new stadiums, new places to play, new opposition to play against. So, yeah, it's all a big kind of a new challenge for me, which is cool. One from Sam. Do you have a favourite tattoo that you're happy to talk about? <laughs> When you asked earlier if I've been getting ripped for anything in the change room, it's been my tattoos. Some of them, it's like Marmite, some of them love it, some of them hate them. But um, yeah, I've got some very, very strange tattoos um, that I actually wish I had explanations for, but I don't really. Um, I have a set of bananas on my left thigh. They're probably, <laughs> they're my favourite. Uh, all the boys have been chipping in to tell me which ones that their favourite are. Um... Jay Z, he said his favourite was I've got a Lego man on my arm. Um, he likes that one. I'm actually booked in soon for another couple. So if you've got, got any suggestions, <laughs> let me know. Can I just ask, what's behind the bananas on the thigh? Is there a reason? Or that's what I mean. Like, I wish I had a reason for you, but I don't. Um, I got my first tattoo when I was 19, I think, and it, I got maybe two or three at that point and at that point they kind of meant something to me you know or had that kind of aspect to it um and then my want for tattoos outgrew um the you know the reasons for getting them so um yeah the the longer it's gone on the the madder they've become um but yeah so like i said some of the boys have, have actually ended up quite liking them so they're going down well 
Dave Watkins is asking about the amazing back heel pass that you did against Huddersfield on Saturday. How many times have you practiced that and how many times have you messed it up? <laughs> I can't say it's something I've practiced that much. Um, as soon as Gaz kind of played the ball to me, I saw Jeff making the run inside, so I knew he was there. But with my whole kind of body position, I thought the only way to get this ball to him is to try something like that. Um, and <laughs> those kind of things are normally high risk, high reward, because if they don't work, you're normally ending up on some sort of meme or something falling over the ball. So um, thankfully that that one worked. Um, hopefully there's there's more stuff like that to come. Tony Bernard is asking, which do you prefer out of these two meals? Battered Mars bar and chips washed down with iron brew or fish and chips with a cup of tea? It's got to be the first one. Um, I've not had that many battered Mars bars, but they actually are really good. I don't know if you guys have ever had one, though. You even heard of that? I've heard of it. It's, maybe it's a tat another tattoo, maybe, a battered Mars bar. Maybe. <laughs> good. I'll write that one down, add it to the list. Um, but yeah, and then a good old iron brew. Can't beat it. Now, the final supporters question. We've saved the best one till last. This is the one that everybody wants to know. This has come from Louise Clark from our Proud Cherries group. Few people have asked about this, actually. Does the Loch Ness Monster exist, and have you seen it? I have not seen it, but as a Indonesian, I have to say, yes, of course it exists. Um, when I was in primary school, we actually did a, a big, huge... Um, kind of, uh, what would you call that, um, exhibition on it. It was almost, obviously, that's, um, there's loads of tourism in Inverness. Um, a lot of Americans come over and, and love to, to go and stand in the rain with a pair of binoculars. Um, if you ask me, there's plenty better things to do. But um, yes, I my dad is just as, um, um, what's the word, my dad is just as, uh, absolute on this that i am uh convinced it's still down there um not too sure if it'll poke its head up anytime soon but if it does i'll let you know another tattoo yeah yeah <laughs> maybe right well i think we're gonna round this one off ryan it's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us we really enjoyed your company and your stories and we're looking forward to seeing you back out on that pitch at vitality stadium this weekend and and for the season ahead now then, if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, we would absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that fans, be it AFC Bournemouth related or the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Ryan Christie and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle, thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. <laughs>